In this video, I'm going to demonstrate all the settings available in Elgato Camera Hub, show you my own best settings, and then I'll explain how each of these settings translate to and interact with the settings in OBS. So starting from the top, advanced device settings, and this shows your firmware version, and then you can change the status LED, always off, on when streaming, always on. Now, on when streaming, I think this is supposed to be like on when recording, because I'm not actually streaming right now, I'm just recording, but it's on. Anyway, let's restore everything to factory defaults so that you can see what it looks like uh, out the box, supposedly. All right. So it's likely that this is what your device is gonna look like out the box, so let's go ahead and fix that. This right here is to zoom, of course. It's digital zoom, so I would avoid using this if you can because you'll decrease the quality. I'm going to skip picture right now and come right back to it and go over exposure because you can see it's really white. And let's go ahead and fix that real quick. So automatic exposure. So center weighted is supposed to expose mostly for what's in the center of the screen and then average just takes the average brightness of the entire room. It doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference in my shot though. Compensation will brighten or darken the image if the automatic was too bright or too dark. So this is a pretty good spot if you had it on automatic, but I'm going to be doing manual settings because that's the whole point of this guide. So let's turn off automatic and then you can't change this metering. Shutter speed, this is like exposure in OBS. I'll talk more about how that interacts there. But this is like a DSLR camera shutter speed. Right next to the M, you see that one over 200. That's the shutter speed, meaning that when I take a picture, there's a hole inside the aperture that it's closed and then it opens for one two hundredth of a second for one two hundredths of a second and then it closes and however much light it lets in during that point is how much light is available for the shot so a higher denominator would be faster one over 250 would be faster it would open and close even faster than that and then slower would be a lower denominator and then that means that it stays open longer the aperture stays open longer and then it lets in more light now, when you're recording video on here or in this, obviously it wouldn't be practical for the shutter to keep opening and closing throughout the entire video. So shutter speed for webcams is more simulated digitally where it lets in light for a certain period of time digitally and then it uses that amount of light to process that frame and then it will do it again for the next frame. So the faster the shutter speed, if you move to the left over here, then the darker it will be because it's letting in less light. But then the more to the right you go, the slower the shutter speed, the more light it lets in. Now, in general, you want to let in as much light as possible, but let me just drop this ISO that so I can demonstrate this. The problem with having the shutter speed too slow and letting in too much light is you start to get motion blur now. So since it's letting in light for so long, your hand or whatever object is moving in between by the time it starts letting in light and by the time it stops. So it puts all of that image together as one frame. So you just get that motion blur. Plus, this is recording at 60 frames per second. So if you want the frame rate to even be 60 frames per second, you're gonna need this to be at least one over 64. Now ISO is the sensitivity of the webcam to light. So decreasing it makes it less sensitive to light, increasing it makes it more sensitive, which will brighten the image, but it will increase the grain. So if I demonstrate here, if I decrease the shutter speed to make it darker, uh, now it is too dark at one over 500. But if I increase the ISO, then it gets brighter, but you'll start to see, it's a good demonstration right here. You can see a lot of the grain, you can see a lot of that static looking effect all over the screen because of the sensitivity to light. Now what you can do is you can go down here to noise reduction and you can decrease that noise, but it softens the image a lot. Like look at my freckles specifically, like you can look at the grain and the freckles and you'll see how there's so much more detail when I turn the noise reduction off. So I always try to have the noise reduction off because it'll make the image too soft. The optimal way to have the least amount of noise or grain is to have the ISO as low as you can possibly get it. And then the shutter speed as slow as you can make it without decreasing the frame rate or without causing too much motion blur. So I like it about usually one over, let's say 250 is pretty decent. I think it's pretty smooth here. We don't have a lot of motion blur. And then we'll increase the ISO a little bit, maybe to like here. Looks pretty decent. Don't want it to get too overexposed. Uh, let's see, something like that maybe. 
yeah, maybe 188. So you can tweak this depending on your settings, depending on your lighting. I have an Elgato ring light in front of me and a key light. I have several lights in here. So you can also change the brightness of the lights themselves. Now let's go back up to picture because this is actually pretty important as well. So contrast will change how much of a difference there is between the lightest and darkest parts of an image. So I have a black shirt and then there's some white on my snapback hat. So if I were to increase the contrast, it will make the blacks even darker. And then even some anything that's kind of a dark color will become closer to black. So my hair that was brown, now it's like pretty much black and then my black shirt's really black and then this is like really bright now. So personally, I actually like to drag this down to 0%. And the reason I do that is because I think that you can actually see the colors more accurately like this without the blacks getting too deep. Now, yes, it's nice if you want your, you know, black shirt to be deep black, but sometimes I'm doing like reviews of like headsets and stuff like that. I'm holding black stuff up to the screen or reviews of like dark stuff like microphones. And I kind of do want to see like the differences between them instead of having them just be like more black. Also what this does when the contrast is this low, if you want to increase the brightness of your entire image, you don't have to worry so much about overexposure. So now if I drop this down, my hat is, I drop this down. My hat is not too overexposed, but if I were to increase the contrast here, then the darks would just be way too dark. And if I want to brighten them up, I'd have to increase the ISO, but I don't want to increase the ISO and just drop the contrast. And that way you can see like my shirt got brighter there from 30 to zero, just cause it's not as deep of a black. Same with my microphone. Saturation is like the intensity of the colors. 55% to where it's default. If you drag it back, it kind of washes it out. I don't really tend to do that too much. Making it go up makes it like oversaturated um, for my preference. But if you want like really vibrant colors, depending on what you're doing, that could be nice. But I tend to keep it where it is at default. Sharpness is to really define the separation between objects. So if you put it up, then things will get like sharper. So so if you put it up, then things will get more defined, but I think it looks a bit artificial. So like it, I look kind of like cartoony or if you've ever taken one of those pictures and you have like one of those ACR effects, it kind of looks like this sometimes Some of those like those filters that like bodybuilders use to make themselves look like really like jacked. And then here you see, uh, you get like an extra outline around objects. Like you look around my mic, if you look around my hand, there's like an extra like, like outline that normally isn't there. But if I drop this down, then you see like my glasses as well. There's that extra outline that kind of goes away. Now, if you drop it down, I don't really see much point to drop it down. It just gets softer though. If you wanted to uh, smooth out your skin or something, then you could decrease the sharpness, but it does make things pretty blurry. So I like to keep this again at its default. The only one I like to really change here is contrast. So we already went over exposure. Now white balance is the most tricky part of this device. This is what the device looks like on automatic white balance. Now my Elgato likes to have them around like 5,200 or something Kelvin, something like that. Uh, but the background is pretty yellow. It's not really that yellow back there. And my skin tone's a little bit off as well. So what I can do is I can use manual white balance. So let's turn automatic off. And now you can slide this from a Kelvin scale. So, so the way the Kelvin scale generally works is the higher the number, then the cooler it is and the lower the number, the warmer it is. But since it's balancing the white, it's actually the opposite. So dragging it to the left will make it more cool and then dragging it to the right will make it warmer. So we got more blue over here and more yellow amber over here. So I try to, there's not a specific number that I really look for. I just try to get it to look as accurate as possible. 4,500 looks kind of decent. It's it's very tricky white balance here though, because you'll notice that if I go to automatic white balance, this color that I can get, the white, I can never replicate this white quite the same way. Uh, this yellowish white, I can't replicate the same way no matter how I change the white balance here. So if I try to drag it up here, it's just never like quite gonna get to the automatic. So that's just something about almost all webcams are like this. There's very few that don't really have this problem that much. 
So it's kind of one of those pick your poisons right here as far as white balance goes. Are you okay with having that little bit of extra red in your image with automatic white balance? And then obviously when the sun changes and or your lighting changes, so I'll demonstrate real quick. I will change the color temperature of my Elgato lights right now. And I'm gonna change the color temperature. I'll make it a lot warmer. So now the color temperature is warmer and the webcam is trying to compensate for that change and it changes the background a bit. I make it cooler and then it changes the color temperature. So it's trying to adjust to kind of get it in the middle. So the problem with this is you can be recording at one time of day and then the sunlight changes just a little bit and then your entire shot can be a totally different color because the webcam is doing auto white balance, which is why I try to not use auto white balance because you don't have a whole lot of control. Now I move the lights back to 5800 Kelvin. But yeah, this is more of a personal preference of how you like the colors because again, you're gonna have a little bit too much red and yellow here, no matter what you do. And then you're either gonna have some more blue slash green if you do manual or you're gonna have too much kind of amber. There's not really a, a happy medium that you can get with the manual white balance. Personally, I just use manual just because I do have the control and I just kind of accept that the whites are gonna be a little bit off but I know that they're not gonna change in the middle of the shot. Down here, you can change the video format. Of course, the resolution and frame rate. You can take a snapshot here and you can change the folder that the snapshots are saved to. And then after all of this is done, you can save your settings to the webcam itself. And what this is supposed to do is supposed to save the settings to the webcam itself so that if you unplug it, and plug it back in, it should default to these settings. This didn't really work out perfectly for me. The first time I did it, I got an error. The second time it said save, but it didn't actually apply those settings the next time I installed it, but that's how it's supposed to work. And then up here, this gear in the upper right, you can change your preferences. So if you wanna take a snapshot and just get an idea of kind of what the settings that I use are, you can do that. So now let me demonstrate how these settings interact with OBS. So first of all, when OBS is open and using these devices, you cannot have this preview window open. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate this. I'll turn this preview off. Now I've activated the device in OBS and it did retain my settings in OBS, which is cool. But now if I go back over to Camera Hub, then the device is currently used by OBS. So I cannot turn the video preview on. And you can actually hide this preview window. So you can just turn this into like a little dock here, which is pretty cool so that it's not gonna like take up the whole screen. So now you can have them both open at the same time. So this is actually really useful. So you can change the settings over here and then they will apply immediately in OBS. Now I'm gonna double click the face cam and then change the settings in OBS and I'll demonstrate how these are a bit different. Contrast is the same. If I change contrast to 3, you see it changes over here. Saturation is the same thing. 35, I guess is 55. The numbers are different, but they function the same way. Sharpness, same thing. White balance, same thing. Automatic white balance will do the same effect as before. Now, one major difference with face cam compared to a lot of other webcams is gain. Because normally I talk about exposure, white balance, and gain as the most important things to change for your webcam. Gain is actually ISO, which is gain, um, is brightness here. And the numbers are very different. So you can't actually tick auto. So if I move the brightness up here, it was 28, then you'll see that it changes the ISO over here. So brightness is actually ISO here. For most webcams, this is more like a levels slider, which just kind of gives like an artificial effect, but this is where the ISO actually is. Now in camera control, we have zoom, which is the same thing. Then exposure value is in these kind of arbitrary terms, negative eight, negative nine and stuff, which I like how Elgato actually has the shutter speed number. You can know uh, one over 250, one two fiftieths of a second, stuff like that. I think that's really useful. I think that's a good job on their part. One thing I did forget to mention was this anti-flicker, which is the power line frequency. This is basically just like for your lights. If your lights are like flickering, then it will try to compensate for that to make it so that the shutter speed changes so that you're not getting like this banding. Um, but from what I understand, if you're using manual settings, then this does not apply anyway. So for the most part, everything that you can change here, 
You can change in OBS. The only thing that you can't change, which I think is very important to have this software is the noise reduction filter because like I demonstrated in some of my other videos, when I first plugged this in, the image appeared as if the noise reduction filter was on. Now, one last thing that I wanna mention is how the exposure differs from other webcams. Normally, when you turn on auto exposure, it is linked to gain. So what that means is, if the lighting suddenly changes, then it will change the shutter speed and the ISO at the same time. So let me go ahead and change the lighting here. I'll turn off the key light and the ring light. Normally what happens for most webcams, it will start changing the shutter speed and the gain at the same time, but Elgato's kind of locks it because it's, it's over here on compensation. So if I change brightness, it's, compensation it's it doesn't automatically move i have to control it myself so automatic is not exactly automatic and which is one of the many reasons that i would actually suggest using manual settings because when you set obs to its default settings it starts at 128 of brightness which would be the compensation so even if you had it at fully automatic if i turn my lights on the ISO value is going to be so high, even though you can see it's automatic here and it's automatic here. I can't take automatic for brightness. So it's always going to be overexposed if you have studio lights. So it's for this reason that I think that manual settings are very useful and definitely preferred. But do know that if you're on automatic settings and it's too bright, then brightness is where you would shift that. And in this video, I'll just go ahead and put auto white balance on just to demonstrate that it looks like, see if you guys, maybe you like it better. As you can see here, it's at UIVY for the uh, video format, 1080p, 60 frames per second, which is all good. Color space default, uh, color, color space default, color range is default. It defaults to partial actually, uh, which is preferred. Uh, you can change it to full, but it does wash out the image a little bit. Yeah, it makes that kind of haze. So I would definitely keep it at partial. And just like I've demonstrated in my other guides, if you wanna use this footage in like Zoom or some other program that's not OBS, you can just start virtual camera and then open like Zoom or something like that. And then you'll go into your settings, video, and then OBS virtual camera. So you can use Elgato face cam, but if you wanna adjust the settings while OBS is open, obviously it's not gonna give you access to this and you won't be able to change the manual settings anyway. So OBS virtual camera will let you get all of those custom settings that you applied in OBS or in Elgato Camera Hub and then use them right in Zoom.